Okay, we're about five or six minutes late, but that's okay. Early, excuse me, but that's okay. We'll go ahead and hopefully we'll have some folks join us. We've got a few. All right, Lane, Alyssa, Heath is here, of course, with me. Okay, I'm sure we'll have some other people join us. Uh, I did send you a message about this week, Wednesday. I'm going to be, I'll, I'll have a pre recorded screencast for you. I'm at a conference Wednesday and Thursday, so I'll be doing that for all my classes. Well, let's talk about um, where we are. And what I'd like to do before we go too much further would be just to very briefly go back and talk about Foster and Gorman. Okay. Now, I did make the key for both of those visible, and everybody handled, most of us handled it pretty well. And I think it will rend. Here we go. And basically what I asked you to do was to change the supply values for those three cities, Cle uh, Cleveland, Bedford, and, and uh, York. And that, that changed, of course, the, the supply for them. And you should have, if you, got it, if you did it correctly, you should have ended up with 37,720 for the minimum cost. And you can go back and look at the original file and see what those were. But I did change those, uh, the changes in the supply. Now, the, the problem, again, was one of these network and shipment problems that we talked about. And then we'll take a look also uh, at Gorman. And I give you the pages there to take a look at those. I think there was some confusion here because maybe some of us just simply weren't, uh, didn't either didn't look at the lecture or the screencast or didn't read the book or both. Um, basically what I asked everybody to do was to change the distance for arc one and to increase that uh, by 11.1% and then to decrease the arc five distances 2.8%. Now, if you were uh, locked in on what we were doing, you understood that what I basically said, we talked about that in terms of uh, networks and we talked about that structure where when I'm talking about an arc, I'm talking about the position, the, the, pardon me, the movement of something, goods, people, information, whatever, from a node, which is an arrival or a destination point to another. And the authors do a good job of talking about that. And then I provided you guys some links to like network structure uh, and to get a sense of how that all works. But that, those are dealing with, with network problems and, lo and, and trying to do load balancing. We're gonna shift to this week to capital budgeting and the authors give us some insights about all that. And I also have some resources here for you in case it's been a while since you took financial man base, uh, intro to finance in terms of some of the capital budgeting basics. Then I also have some information here for you on what we call order and setup costs and how those come into play. Order costs tend to be fixed costs. Uh, setup costs tend to be uh, variable costs based upon the volume of business that you're gonna do. And so you'll wanna take a look at that. And so we, in what we're gonna see this week, week is we have a couple of cases where we're trying to do some capital budgeting but we're using a binary approach that is mutually exclusive projects. If we do one, we can't do the other. And in capital budgeting, that's not always the case, but it's pretty typical that I'll have a list of projects that I want to do or could do. And then I have to go back and make a choice on which one is going to be the, the uh, which project, capital project am I, going, am I going to do or perform? And so we'll take a look at that. I also have, um, I have a link there for the Northwest Core Method, which is another transportation technique uh, using solver and then some links to jobs that are out there in logistics and in supply chain management, Bureau of Labor data. Uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again, the areas in logistics 
and supply chain, the opportunities for employment are just exploding because of the internet plus you know, all the e-commerce that goes on that side, but more, most importantly, in terms of global supply chain. And so if you're a management major, especially, and you're coming upon that senior and saying, I don't have anything and I don't have any prospects, I would certainly encourage you to go take a look at those. Now, the, the, the authors are going, to, are going to walk us through the, the capital budgeting constraint. And as they talk about here, involving zero, one variables. And what they mean is a yes or no answer. Okay, that's all they're talking about. And that's why they're gonna be dealing with, we're gonna be dealing with capital budget problems, a couple of them, where the, the choice is mutually exclusive. In other words, if I choose one, I can't do the other. And I've got those pages there for you, lined out the, um, our, the ice cold case is over on page 326 to 3, 3, 328 to 330, which gives you some background on that case. And then 330 to 332 is RMC. And I have each of these, I have the ice cold explain how we got there. The RMC case without setup costs where we assume we don't have to retool our line or let's say if I'm a restaurant, I don't have to add a new, uh, I have to add a new component to my kitchen or something like that. Um, then one where we have set up costs. These are good cases to help us understand how we can look at possible outcomes in terms of doing when we do capital budgets. So we'll take a look at this very first one and they're going to get, here's the ice cold and the, and the authors start through this, uh, they walk us through this process where plant exp expansion, these are different, uh, they're different, uh, different choices. They can expand their plant, they can expand their warehouse, they can get some new machinery or, or they can do some new product R&D. And it's a one if it's, if it's accepted, a zero if it's rejected, because again, these are mutually exclusive. So we're gonna choose one project over the other or over the others. And they walk us through what they call a multiple choice constraint, okay? And you could see warehouse one, if it's accepted, or second, warehouse expansion projects accepted, or a third project expans, expansion. So we're, when we talk about these constraints, what, we're, what the authors are saying to us, the constraint is not necessarily just one value, it could be two or three values as they show us here in terms of degrees to which we do plant expansion. And that's all that's going on there in, 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 that, in that narrative of the text. And so they give us that requirement where they've all got to equal one, okay? And so that we know that those are need, need will need those constraints, the one, two, three, that is plant, uh, uh, we expand it, uh, and we'll go back to the choices real quickly, the four, the, the four uh, those, the multiple choice. And this is, a, this is a different tack than we've taken before in terms of our choices on the constraints. Now what I've been doing throughout, throughout the courses, I've been saying, okay, here's, here's a certain case, here's the original situation, the original, the starting scenario, change these variables and manipulating them. So we've already been doing that when we've done things like change the supply figures or change the arc distance. No different here, but in this case, we're conscious of what we're doing because our constraints, we're, we're gonna deal with the constraints on a continuum. If it's accepted or it's ejected, this is an expansion or a second warehouse project or a third. So we've got three projects we could do with the warehouse and we're either do, do, do that or not. So that's why they talk about there the multiple choice constraint. That's more like the real world, okay? And so, and then we walk through the, the alternatives and there we be. 
And as, you've, as I've said before, this course is, is, is more about, is as much about a way to think about dealing with problems in management as it is in terms of just simply putting numbers into the solver and running them, okay? And again, notice, I've got these, yeah, I don't do that. I've got these constraints that run along a continuum, okay? And this could be the amount of money that I wanna spend. And so as, they, as the authors show us there, uh, if, you add, if you add a new, some, some, if you have five potential warehouse expansion programs, then you can up that up to where the new requirements two. And then again, they have to be less than or equal to two. So when you build those constraints, it's just a matter of, of degrees. That's all that's really going on here, but that's a significant difference because now we're looking at building in constraints along a set of conditions. And they walk us through the idea of conditional and, co and co-requisite constraints. One thing's gotta happen, the other has to happen. And they give us a graphical representation of that. And you can see, again, it's a network problem of sorts, okay? But in this type, we're, we're, it's a capital budgeting because we're trying to figure out, well, how do we want to allocate resources, okay? And we've got source uh, supply A, customer one, B, and the iterations that would, would go on from there, depending on how many possible sources, how many sources of supply we have and or how many customers we have. And that's all that's really going on there. So we have a node, it's just in the shape of, of, of something different, but it's still a node in the network. And we have another node, and then the arc is the, is the, is the amount or the distance between these two. And that's all that we're really trying to get done there. Now, they're gonna tell us, they give us some information here about the sensitivity analysis. But what I'd like us to do is let's go ahead and I've got the file there, and I want I want to start with ice cold, okay? And let's let's open that file up and download and take a look at what we've got going on there. Okay, so download that file, and we've got this project that we're we have these projects that we can choose to undertake. Okay, and you'll want to save it on down to your down to your uh, desktop. And if you look, at this looks pretty familiar. We've got we've got the possible capital budgeting projects in which we can engage, and we can allocate these. We can do capital budgeting. I could allocate everything to one of these, or nothing to any of them, or along some type of continuum, as they've done here and they give us the net present value of, uh, for each of these. And I'm gonna go ahead and just make it a little bit easier to follow through. And we'll, we'll do the same thing with the capital available. And we're plan when we're doing this planning, we're also trying to balance off not only our needs, but we're trying to balance off the available capital that we have. It's a budgeting process. And what we're trying to do, our objective function, is to maximize our net present value. Okay, so you can see we can use Solver to handle this. Now, the, the, as I've said before over and over and over again, especially the first two chapters, the authors talk about the difference between problem solving and decision making. And capital budgeting is probably the best example I can think of that. We've run, we've plugged in the data, we've plugged in, we, we've, we've plugged them all into, into Solver, okay? We've figured out our constraints, all right? And now we can run it and we get a present value and we have a solution. But the question is we've, we've solved the problem but the question is, is, is this the decision that we want? 
And as we move through the course, we're gonna encounter a thing which is called sub-optimization, which simply means although there's an optimal response or answer, when you put in the organizational element, the human element, company politics, strategic uh, perceptions of strategic needs, et cetera, sometimes the answer on paper is not the quote unquote right answer. Although it's optimal, it may, the, 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 an organization may choose to sub-optimize. So you're gonna, we're gonna see that as we, as we run in. So I've given you some instructions over here, okay? And to enter some data and see what it looks like, okay? And so I said over here in cell F20, let's uh, enter a, a one. Okay, so let's go to F20. And we'll put in a one, okay? And then we're gonna, and we'll see if the if we increase the net pre, the the net present maximum net present value. Right, so we can go back over here. We'll click on the data. Okay. And wonderful. Solver's not up. Great. Anybody out there got solver on? Yeah. Is it working for you? Okay. Well, obviously, network. Let's see here. I've got that. I've got the what is so. And of course, it's not gonna work for me today. But if you put the one in, in there and sit in, uh, in cell uh, F, F20. Okay, I put it in the wrong one there. Let's put it over here. I'm gonna to have to save this to my file, I think, which would be nice to. And here we go. Okay, there we go. Now, I'd ask you to put the one in F20 so I'm going to X all of these out, delete those. I'm just going to put the one in F20. And then I'm going to run the solver. And it should be running. Let me see if I can add this in. Put the one in there and see what it does to the, what it does to the uh, net present value. Just run the one and see what it does. My hunch is it probably reduces it, does it not? You just do the new research, new product research, and it should reduce it. Now I'm gonna just come over here and just for kicks, I'm gonna put it under plant expansion. So I'm gonna put choose, I'm gonna choose just to do the plant ex expansion. That's all I'm gonna do. Okay. Now, Instead of the plant expansion, I'm just gonna choose, and I'm, I'm just going through each one of my choices. I'm gonna do the warehouse expansion. And you can see each time as I make one of those choices, I can do just the new machinery if I choose to do that. I keep getting these maximum net present values versus what I had I'll just close this off. I won't save the changes. Okay. And let me, since it's not opening up for me, let me show you the rend up here. And here I got a, a net present value of 140, okay. changing out those variables. Now, what I'm interested in, what I'm interested in you doing is this, let me open up this jewel again. Okay. Let's 
I'm gonna see if this solder is gonna work for me. Ah, okay, there we go. Now, if you take a look there at row 20, okay, you see the investment plan, SIP. We've got ones in there, <clears throat> which means we say, okay, I'm gonna do every one of these projects. Now, again, we're operating in a condition where we have a limited amount of money and people, et cetera, to do this work, but we've said, okay, I'm just gonna choose, I'm gonna do all of them. Now, so well, how would I do that? Well, if you look here for a moment at the capital available, maybe I went back to the bank or, my, or, or maybe I did a stock offering to get, pardon me, some additional capital so I could operate all the projects. Now they're still mutually exclusive. If so, if I make them mutually exclusive, I choose one over the others. But let's look at what we get here. We've got a net present value when we do every single one of them, except the new product research. You see that? Down there in row 20. Now, before we go any further, take a look up here in this array over here where I have the financial data and I have our choices in terms of capital projects and then I have the net present value and then I have the capital to, capital to invest in those projects. Now what's, what the, what, what's assumed here is almost like an internal rate of return scenario where it's assumed I take the money I make and reinvest it. You got me? So I've got, the, and that's why I have that, that capital available business there for each of those four years for each of those choices. But as I program this in, and these are management decisions I've made before I got here. I've said, okay, assume these mean zero. So I haven't allocated any money for new machinery. I've got money allocated for everything each year, but no money for new, but, but only the machinery, I'm only gonna put money into it in year one and year two. See it? Now, one of the things that makes this kind of a, a, a somewhat naive case is this. What, while I'm given net present values here, looking at this, especially with, with, the, uh, with the machinery, the machinery should have a, pi, a positive cash flow, although it's not real cash, okay? It should still show up on the books as positive cash. That is in terms of the depreciation. And you know, depreciation, obviously, at depreciation, you recall, is not real money in the sense of cash, it reduces my tax liability. So we have nothing there in terms of any capital investment and we're not seeing anything realized there. If I were doing this for real, I'd try to figure out how to work through those numbers for those two years, but that's okay. We're just gonna assume this is a straight up, I put 10, 10 million, uh, 10,000 10, bucks, 10, 10, 10 thousand dollars in one year ten thousand dollars in the next and then I let it sit till the last year at year four where I put in four thousand got it anybody have a question about this what we've done so far okay how many of us have had finance Intro to finance. Did you do capital budgeting and in intro to finance? You recall that you did. I hope you did. And to, and to talk about mutually, mutually exclusive versus independent projects. If they're mutually exclusive, we say, I've got to make a choice of one or the other. If they're independent, I say, then I, I don't care. I have the money to do everything. <laughs> Obviously, if you look at what's up here, in the financial data, I don't have the money to do everything I want to do. That's why I've allocated the capital. And so I'm going to use Solver to help me do those capital allocations. 
Now below here, I'm using the binary, a one being a yes, a zero being a no, okay? Now right now, with, with the configuration that we have, we've got a net maximum net present value of 140, okay? And as I give you in that ice, in that ice cold explained, I give you some verbiage there in changing or playing around with each of those. So right now I'm at 140. So instead of doing this, I'm gonna say, okay, I'm just gonna do warehouse expansion, new machinery, uh, no project. So I'm gonna have, I'm gonna take that configuration and make that a zero, and let's see what happens with the net present value. And it goes down. Now, why would the net present value go down if I chose not to expand the plant? A common sense answer, why? Uh, true, you didn't spend the money. Plus, what, what do I do with, uh, what, what does plant expansion, if I don't do a plant expansion, what does that do to me? My, yeah, exactly. It keeps my production at a, at a cap. It keeps me within some constraints in terms of, of what I can do. The plant warehouse, the plant expansion, assuming I'm going to get some new equipment, which is what it looks like I'm going to do there. Uh, and because I'm going to expand it, of course, the more stuff I produce, the more I have to store. So that's why I have a warehouse expansion that follows along with it. Follow me? And we look at that warehouse, the plant is fixed and, and variable cost. So that's gonna be the total cost of the plant. The variable costs are gonna be those are expand, that are associated with additional production. Now, instead of that, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna say I'm gonna do the plant extraction, uh, expansion, so I'm right back. Hey, let me say this. One of the things about Solver that makes it, and using it for this, is if you're in a meeting and folks are really trying to work through and talk through numbers, this gives them an interactive tool. Now I'd say this, this is a, uh, not, all, not an all the bells and whistles tool uh, versus what you'd see out in industry. You'd see a very nice, very, very nice product. Companies that do a lot of capital budgeting are gonna have products off the shelf, but this is essentially the same process that you go through. So this, this time, I'm not gonna expand the warehouse, so I'm gonna put a zero there. Now let's see what happens. And the maximum net present value does what? It decreased. It decreased because although I can make more stuff, I don't have anywhere to keep it. Okay, does that make sense? And literally, this is just how, how it's done. Now, again, company politics, individual relationships, say between the people at the, at, the, at, the, at the C level in a company, or maybe between a pair of partners, or if it's a family owned business and, and mom or dad are making a transition out and the youngster is coming on board. All of those things can cloud all of it, or what can really cloud it is if you have some kind of different perspectives and you also have a lender or investor who puts in their five cents worth. Okay. So this just lets you gives you an opportunity to walk through that. Let's look at the new machinery and let's put a zero there and see what happens. Now we expanded the plant, we expanded the warehouse. We didn't put any new money into product research. We didn't put any new money into machinery. And my net maximum net present value is awfully close to what it was when I started. What does that tell me? What do you think? Yes, what it probably tells me, you're exactly right. It tells me I probably have some slack built into that system. And I may not be using the equipment or that plant as efficiently as I need to do. You got me? 
Now, out, folks who manufacture on a pretty good, on a pretty large scale, have all kinds of data from their industry that lets them figure out down to the cent how much it should cost to make something. They'll have those statistics and they'll publish them so they can all compare themselves against each other. Now there are gonna be some components or some things that they consider proprietary, but usually it's proprietary is the materials and the process, but they'll come up with, you'll have some industry benchmarks. It's okay, where are you going with that? Well, if I, have a ben if, if I know those benchmarks, then this <coughs> lets me determine how, to what extent I have a slack resource or not, the extent to which I have, I'm efficient. And that is where I can go back to a process we talked about, the data envelopment analysis, where we work with multiple facilities or multiple locations, and I do what? I build a composite against which I test everybody. I benchmark it. So when you're at work and you hear somebody talking in the terms of cost, et cetera, benchmarking, that's, that's gonna give you an idea they're using data development analysis in some way or the other. We, we I think it with that DEA, it was a hospital. We had some of the inputs of the trained nurses and doctors and trained. We had some inputs and I don't remember them all. But the bottom line was we we built this composite, this ideal, and said we'll test against everybody. You might be able to do that here, but when I'm looking at this and I haven't put any new machinery, new product research. Our colleague is exactly right. I probably can do a lot better with what I have. In other words, I may have some slack resources in terms of, of plant, of, of how I use my plant. And that means I probably have some slack resources in terms of my production. How many of us have had the production and project course? How many of you have taken it? None? You're taking it right now? Uh, are you covering more about project management or are you getting into some uh, production stuff? Okay. Okay. That, that's, and, and I, that course has been slanted that way for a long time and, and well, it should because almost everything you do is going to be in projects when you go to work. But it's important for you to understand, especially if you get in a situation, let's say you're managing, oh, you go to work for somebody, uh, let's say you go to work for an insurance company that has multiple operate facilities, or you go to work for a restaurant chain, or you go to work for somebody that manufactures or distributes stuff, or assembles things, all right? What you're gonna find is that while you may have an ideal capacity, there's an effective capacity. And let me give you a really, really pertinent example, okay? I've taught in this classroom for well over 10 years. And I can tell you, I know from experience, that when I've had this class full, and I have something on this screen up here, I'll have people on the other side of there peering because it's flat. I'll have people over here, they can't see through me, obviously, and it's flat. Now, the theoretical capacity of this lab is 41 students. But the real true capacity, the true operating capacity is less than that it's because I have to take into account chairs that, that don't work, machines that don't work. I have to take into account that if you're way over there, you're going to have a hard time seeing this screen or way over here. So when we talk about these, the plant expansion, we're always going to be saying, okay, what's the, in, on paper, what does it look like versus what is, what's reality? and paper and reality never do match up. So that's one important caveat about this case that you're gonna want, you'll want to understand. Now let's go back over here and let's go ahead and, and uh, we're gonna do the new machinery. So let's put the new machinery back in. And we're back to our maximum net present value. And now let's put some money into project. Let's choose to do the project research, which will throw us off. Or will it? Now, in order to do all four of these things, we made a sacrifice. And I'm gonna highlight this array of cells up here. 
what did I sacrifice in order to do all four things? What's missing? Are there investments missing in those different years? I chose not to do the new machinery. I stopped at those two years and then a third and then at year four, another investment. But I've got those two years there where I didn't do it. But I can do all of these things and I have a net present value Am I kosher as far as the left-hand side and right-hand side? Well, okay, we can take a look at that. Let's look at them. Our left-hand side doesn't add up. The left-hand side says it's got to be less than or equal to 40, and my left-hand side's 50, but my right-hand side's 40. Then you see another anomaly. The right-hand side values are above, which what this is telling me is I'm gonna to need to put some more money into the available capital to do this if I wanna achieve those types of results. So now I have a figure I can think about because I've got 100, and I'm looking at the capital available and I've got 90, 130, 165, I'll need to increase that capital. But if I go back to the original assumptions, let me throw eraser would be nice today. There you go. Um, I'm gonna have to increase the amount. Now, if I don't do the product research, let's look at this for just a second. It's okay, what are you trying to say? Here's what I'm trying to say. I've got 140 net present value, $140,000 net present value, if I do three of the four projects. If I do all four projects, I can squeeze, I can get another 37,000 out of it. So I would want to come, I would want to come back over here and say, all right, what this means then is I've got to figure out how much more money do I want to borrow or take out of my operations? If I'm funding a capital project, if I'm an immature company, a newer, younger company, what I will usually do is I will take money from my net income, which is the most expensive form of capital you can possibly have because you're using your money. The worst part is you can't invest that money in something that you could be guaranteed a return. And even worse is you miss on any opportunities where you might have that capital to get a really good return. So you're pouring the money back into the operation. So what are my options? If I need some more capital, what do I, where do I go? What do I do? What are my options? I need more money for my company, what are my options? Okay, I could take a loan. I could take a loan, for, say a short-term loan, like a revolving credit, right? Could I do that? Could I issue bonds? For sure, I could issue bonds. And to, because these are capital projects, if I didn't want to pay interest on the money, what could I do to get some money? I could issue stock, common stock. Now the problem is, is if I issue the common stock, I have to ask myself, all right, what type of dilution effect, dilution am I having in terms of my current shareholders versus how much money I'll actually net. And if I think in your finance course, I, I would assume you went through one of those problems where you said, okay, a company A needs to borrow 100, wants to issue, have a stock issue for a million bucks. Here's what it's gonna cost in terms of the fees, okay? Here's how, here's how the additional stocks will, 
will impact the number of stocks that are out there total, which impacts your balance sheet, et cetera. So while it's often the cheapest, it's maybe not the best. Now let's click on the solver for just a second. And let's see how this problem is constructed. And we, we assume that it's a simplex LP. And we assume it's a simplex LP because we assume that, the, that we're operating in, in the, a total cost environment, i.e. fixed cost plus variable cost equals total cost. Fixed cost being those costs I have to pay, variable cost being those that change or vary with the level of production. Anybody have a question? Yes? Now, I understand that on Monday morning, September the 30th, this is not the most exciting thing you could ever think about. But trust me, there will come a day in time if you move up the ladder <laughs> when you're playing with real money and not monopoly money like we do here at school, you'll be sweating bullets trying to figure out which one should we do. And you may find yourself embroiled in a, in a discussion that's pretty, and it can get pretty heated sometimes around the table about, well, where do we put our money? Should we expand at this time at all? And then trying to figure out different lenders. Who do I use? How much should I borrow? Is it better for me to issue a bond, a five-year or 10-year bond? Is it better for me to issue common stock? And you'll need to be thinking about that, not just in terms of the outcome numerically, but strategically, what does it do? If you issue stock, my advice would be this. Be ready in about three to four, maybe five years to buy that stock back at a premium. Your project should make enough money to cover your required return plus something to pay back your shareholders and give them a payback. If you don't, <laughs> in today's environment, they're gonna be looking at you pretty hard. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of long-term thinking that goes on, and especially on Wall Street. They want everything now, and it just doesn't always happen like that. Well, this is the ice cold, and again, we see where we balanced these out and we made these choices and we could see our maximum net present value of 140. So what you could do is, and what I'd like you to do, would be to, I gave you some instructions there about playing around with it a little bit, but what I'd also like you to do would be to take this tab and, and replicate it three times or four times and then choose one of those projects and see what happens. None of the others choose all of them and then some variation in between. And you could in fact make yourself a little table where you go through your choices and put in the results. You could use the scenario analysis for all intents and purposes, the scenario manager. And that would be just simply a matter of coming over here and doing the what if analysis. Okay. And you could add the base case, which is what we've got here. Then you could add all projects, et cetera, ad infinitum, to see what the range of outcomes are. Now we do know this, if we want to increase the maximum net present value, we're gonna to have to increase something here. The question is what? If I increase the new product research, we're gonna to have to go get some additional money here. And that changes, and, and you can look at the change to the left hand and the right hand side to figure out how much you'd have to borrow. Or you'd have to issue in terms of a stock issuance if you were going to do that. When you did intro to finance, did you go through stock, stock issuance? The fees involved, what you're going to get, what it will do to shareholder earnings per share. Etc. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
to, that's ice cold. And let me stop for a moment. Anybody have a question about what we did here? Yes, no? Now, if I, if I ask you to run a sensitivity report, why would I ask you to do that? What would be the point of me asking you to run a sensitivity report? You want to go back and take a look at that. The sensitivity report will tell you how a change in one of those variables or the constraints, what it does in terms of my result, i.e. a change in the objective function. In this case, I want the objective function to increase. So sensitivity report I'm looking for would be something that says if you do this, you'll get this additional amount in your net present value, Mac trying to maximize it. Now, I'm gonna talk for just a few minutes about the, and we start a little bit early, so we'll, we'll, we'll be good here. Um, I want to talk for just a few minutes about this other case, the RMC. And And let's see what it's ice cold. I forgot what pages RMC's on. And we'll take a look here. Three thirty to three thirty-two. Okay, I'm way ahead. Now, RMC is going to be a good, I'll just search the book. All right, and we'll pop up here to 3.30, there we go. Pardon me. Being an idiot, I'm not using the search function. Okay. In RMC, this is folks that they're, this is a, this is a load, pro, one of these load problems, and they make, they make some type of chemical solvent, and they've got so many tons of a fuel additive, and then how many tons, a certain number of tons of solvent base, and then a carpet cleaning fluid. So they mix this stuff up and sell this product. And they give us linear programming for that, or we're trying to maximize what we make given the, the constraints in materials <clears throat> one, two, and three, okay? Now that's, that, that's not too different than what we saw before when we worked with Leisure Airlines where we said, well, okay, the distances to any one of these places, or we've seen, or we, or we dealt with the cost of trans transshipment, the cost of using a particular arc from one node to the other. This is just another one of those but this time we're just taking fuel, we're taking materials and mixing them together. And they show us the solution of that problem. And they introduce something that is important for you to understand. The product and the setup costs and the maximum production. Now what's implied there are the variable costs that are associated with this. Setup cost is a variable cost. If somebody comes to me and says, uh, hey, I just got an order, and the setup cost is gonna apply to the following. People who work in extractive environments, meaning I go and get something out of the earth, or I raise a bunch of cattle and I slaughter them. 
uh, or I'm in an assembly environment, manufacturing environment where a bunch of stuff comes in and I assemble it, make it, or in a partial assembly where stuff comes in partially finished and I, and I take the finished good and or, I, or, or, or a distribution. But those first three are gonna be more typical. The setup cost becomes critical because it's variable cost. If you remember, mar contribution margin equals revenue per unit less the variable cost. That's the money I have to pay for fixed costs. So I'm, I have to worry about these setup costs from a financial perspective, but also from a strategic perspective, okay? Now, a good example in the United States was the steel industry where at one point, we just, people would take a bunch of lead and iron, uh, and, uh, iron ore and bring it into a gigantic facility and they'd burn it and shape it or, or they'd extract some, some particular materials out and make a specialized material, but most of it was just massive long runs of steel. Well, eventually, because they got support from the, the, the Japanese took, that, took over that industry, primarily not because they were better at it than we are, is their government subsidized them and said, we're gonna take this industry away from the United States, so we'll pay you to make steel. Isn't that nice? No, because we're good capitalists, we don't do that. But because we're good capitalists, we do one thing and that is we try to work with the capital, with the marginal rate on capital tax. Plus, we also try to give people all kinds of incentives to engage in a particular industry. And we have a thing called what? When, when I use a machine and it starts to wear out, what do I call it? And I write it off my tax. Depreciation, exactly. God bless America. Depreciation. I write off the depreciation on machines, okay? It's a non-cash cost, but it reduces my tax due. Since it reduces my tax, it does what in terms of my net income? If my taxes go down, what happens to net income? Does it go up or go down? It goes up. Isn't that wonderful? Now, all of you, if you're smart, you'll benefit from that. You say, how am I going to do that? As long as Congress keeps you having the ability to write off your home mortgage interest, that that's gold. Because if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're smart and you, and you handle things in a good way, each year you're gonna wind up getting money back, or you should. Of course, now they've changed the deduction, so for us it may or may not be a good deal. But I want you to take a look at that case and look through the setup costs and how that impacts and how that works itself all the way through. And then Wednesday, I'll have a pre-recorded screencast for you to take a look at. Now, I think I was clear to everybody in the email, message I sent you about what's going on being in the conference. So Wednesday and Thursday, boom. Got it? Okay, folks, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hope you had a good weekend. Thank you for being here and being attentive. Appreciate it.